Alright guys, welcome back to F1 News. Red Bull's helmet Marco reveals the driver market has gone into chaos over the last few days with many big updates emerging behind the scenes during the Japanese Grand Prix. Three drivers mainly under the spotlight today. Carlos Sainz, Fernando Alonso and most certainly Sergio Perez. Who's going to end up at Red Bull? Who's going to end up at Mercedes? Audi getting involved as well. But also, who might turn up at Aston Martin? Very interestingly. Very much interested in your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. First of all, lots to say on the cast this weekend. Interesting performances from top to bottom, arguably the most revealing race of the season so far in terms of expectations versus reality. Ferrari were six tenths faster this race than they were six months ago when the last Suzuka Grand Prix happened, despite the fact that in six months ago's race, they brought their like biggest upgrade of the season to Japan and it worked very well indeed, certainly for Charles Leclerc. So that is big progress in the Ferrari. Even Carlos Sainz says that he expects Rebel to hold the advantage for the first third of the season at which point Sainz and Ferrari believe they can actually close the gap, which maybe is wishful thinking. I don't know how much was still in the tank of the Red Bull this past weekend. But I said before the Grand Prix, if Ferrari were within three tenths-ish of the Red Bull, that was an impressive weekend, I thought. They were three and a half tenths, something like that, off the pace of the Red Bull during the Grand Prix in the hands of Charles Leclerc, to be honest, on a very impressively executed one-stop strategy. I'm not sure any other car could do that yesterday, but the Ferrari can, which is quite the role reverse in terms of tyre degradation, the Red Bull as well, it's maybe not the perfect car in some regards. Max Verstappen still says that, well, shot, look, the car's unbelievable, right? It is a rocket ship again, but it doesn't seem to be the best at every single feature. Now, what they do say is Red Bull, they've improved in the slower speed corners compared to last year, but street circuits just don't have some low speed corners as a feature. They have, well, they do have slow speed corners, but they're often just 90 degree corners, which often could be quite different in their characteristics to many of the lower speed corners on other circuits. And they're still unsure how the RB20 is going to work over bumps and over curbs. So there's some concerns Red Bull still have going to street circuits. We'll see how that develops, I suppose. Aston Martin, though, they brought upgrades this weekend, as did Red Bull, and they did work compared to their previous performances. Must be said, they worked in the hands of Fernando Alonso. They recovered five tenths from Merck, three tenths from Ferrari in race trim from Bahrain, which is very impressive, but it only worked for Alonso. Whether you just call that an, well, a Lance Stroll skill issue, which you might well, and probably for good reason, that's another question. But actually, Alonso thought he drove incredibly well this weekend. Now, do you think that he really believes this was a top five weekend ever in his career? Because you know, he feels like what he did in qualifying, which was extremely impressive, and his Grand Prix performance, especially compared to Stroll, was really good. Okay, do I think he thought he did a great job this weekend? Yes. Did he do a great job this weekend? Yes. Is it his top five in that category ever? I would say he's likely to be over it, just because questions around his future. Is he going to go to Aston Martin? Is he going to get another seat and another team? And we know that Fernando Alonso plays these games in the media very well indeed. So any opportunity to say, look, I just had one of my best ever performances at the age of 42 this past weekend's Time to sign me up, Red Bull type thing. That might make a fair bit of sense. Just to look as well, this is tyre degradation data from the Grand Prix on the medium compound, just to really compare Alonso and Stroll. It's what I mainly wanted to do here. But there are some other things to read into. Got to take this data with a bit of a grain of salt because it doesn't really consider who is in dirty air, you know, circumstances in the Grand Prix affecting things. But it's just worthy to look at, right? The Leclerc was obviously very impressive. The Alpines had damage, so maybe they just didn't have the enough downforce to even put any stress on their tyres, maybe. Maybe. But a question I do have for you guys on the Red Bulls, do you think this is indicative of actually pushing a bit more than usual? Because just in my opinion, if Verstappen was cruising to the line, I might have expected him to have lower tyre degradation than this, right, in theory. And it was the same story on the hard compound as well, where the Red Bull had middle of the pack tyre degradation. If he was really cruising and there was way more performance in the Red Bull, you might expect lower tyre degradation. Then again, it's quite possible that Red Bull just kind of turn the engine down or, you know, not turn the engine down per se, but reduce the deployment of the battery power. So maybe he was still pushing hard, but yet the car was going slower than it actually is possible of. I just think it's something to look at. Mercedes, though, they had a tough time again for another weekend in a row. Total Wolf says, oh, don't worry, guys. We just used this weekend as a nice little testing session, and we're going to be good to go from China and beyond. Their upgrade will arrive in Imola. The belief is that it's going to change substantially, potentially, their mechanical platform, which might be the key behind their problems right now. 
they have a batch of upgrades in the works. There was a question, certainly after Jeddah, whether their upgrades are even going to work, and I'm still not sure they are sure whether that's going to be true or not, but they are going to try, and Imolo is going to be the subject of when that's going to happen. Hamilton did have damage, by the way, I mentioned it yesterday, I hadn't seen any images of it at the time, but yeah, you guys can see the damage here to the front right end plate on Hamilton's car, that's why he made the call to swap with Russell. But even if there was no damage, the car's not great, is it? I mean, sure, it performed surprisingly well in Sector 1 during qualifying, but as Hamilton says, pretty sad, really. Well, it's sad for him, but also it's more sad for, like, the team and for George Russell, because Russell has to stay. Hamilton at least is leaving, right? As he says, the car is never what I hoped it would be. It is never what we hoped it would be. So, pretty blunt, to be fair. Obviously, very disappointed. But Total Wolf says exactly why, or why the reason is they simply don't really understand the explanation behind that reason or a potential solution. So as Toto says, the car is so complex for us, where we put it in terms of aero and mechanical balance, and these two need to correlate. We followed a certain trajectory over the last years and keep turning and circling around. We came to a point to say, okay, we've got to do something different here because we are measuring downforce with our sensors and pressure tabs, and it is saying we have 70 points more downforce in a particular corner than in Melbourne last year. But on a lap time, so Melbourne to Melbourne, 23 to 20 but on lap time it is not a kilometer per hour faster so it doesn't make any sense so what is going on here with mercedes now 70 points of downforce this was one of these like it's not quite arbitrary the points of downforce thing it refers to lift coefficients so it does have some basis in reality the very challenging thing is to translate lift coefficients or points of downforce into actual lap time you guys might remember that lewis hamilton said that they had to sacrifice mercedes 90 points of downforce back in 2022 Two on the W13 to make sure the car was actually functional in a straight line and uh, you know it wouldn't destroy Hamilton's spine or the car itself with the porpoising and all this because of the problems they had. So they had to sacrifice 90 points back then. The rumor was at the time that the Mercedes W13 was a second faster in the simulator than it was in reality and that would have basically made it the fastest car or there or thereabouts. So let's say you know 90 points of downforce is a second or so. You know we're talking a very sizable chunk of lap time here that may well put the W15 in the wind tunnel in the simulation on the same pace as the Red Bull or very close to it. Maybe the same pace as the Fry, we might be able to speculate. But the reality is that the downforce they're generating is not usable. So there's a few explanations here. Either they're not measuring correctly and they actually don't have this extra downforce they think they have. That seems rather unlikely. One option is they have somewhat less than 70 points that Toto was saying and he's effectively lying to appease the sponsors or something. I don't know. I'm not really sure I believe that idea. The more likely candidate is that, sure, they're generating more downforce, but whatever's going on with their floor, the suspension, the mechanical platform is not able to solve it. And the interesting thing I would say is that Mercedes now are behind McLaren, and they would be behind Aston Martin if Stroll wasn't significantly worse than Fernando Alonso. So they would be the third fastest powered Mercedes-powered car right now in the championship, and they aren't far off being right there. They're certainly significantly behind McLaren. The Aston has the same rear suspension as the Mercedes and performed well in Alonso's hands this weekend. They brought an upgrade. Sure, the Aston isn't great, but all things considered, it was better than the Merc. So maybe it's not the rear suspension causing this problem. Is it an issue somewhere else? They don't really seem to know. They will continue conducting tests to try and figure it out. Will Mercedes even get a podium this year? That's another question for you guys in the comments, right? Because the last few years, it's got worse and worse, but this year may be the worst ever. And this is when Mercedes tweet this out today. They put it on Instagram as well. If you don't love me at my worst, the W15, you don't deserve me at my best, the W11. Now, I know that it's a joke, right? It is a joke, but... I just think this is in a bit poor taste to me in terms of like a social media strategy. Red Bull even get a slam dunk opportunity to come in the replies and say, you okay, hun, type thing. Like you guys are basically falling off and now you're crying about it on social media. And I feel like Mercedes fans will be quite embarrassed at this now because if you do this in 2022 with the W13, when the year's nearly at the end, you've won a race in Brazil, it's like, you know what, if you didn't you know, enjoy this season, you don't deserve us when we're back to our best type thing. Because back then it was like, well, W13 wasn't great, but next year we're going to be back type thing. That's obviously not happened. They've just got worse for the last four years in a row. And now they're, they're basically calling their car their worst car, right? Because here it is, the W15. Their drivers have to drive it. And it's almost kind of implying that, oh, you know, don't hate on the team. Don't hate the car. The drivers might hate it. Or they might complain about it. But you're not allowed to. It's a joke. But um, I just don't think that serious Formula One teams would do this. I know it's a social media team as well. So I'm not really sure what my opinion on this is. But Ferrari or like another team that takes themselves seriously, I don't 
don't think would have this as part of their social strategy. And like, you're never seeing Ferrari put this out, no matter how bad they are. Not in my opinion anyway. So yeah, I'm not sure Mercedes are in the best spot from any angle and uh, everyone is clouding on them. And you can understand why. They, of course, will go to China in a couple of weekends time. It's a sprint race as well. I just wanted to mention this, a sprint race in China next weekend. They haven't raced at this circuit since 2019. There's like no data on this track with these cars, obviously. And they're gonna get one hour of practice and then straight into, you know, the sprint Grand Prix format weekend. So I don't know if that's deliberate. I imagine it may well be deliberate by Formula One to decide, all right, that's gonna be a sprint so that the teams have no time to set things up and there will be a sprint to race immediately. Park Ferme kicks in and, you know, arguably it's gonna create more chaos for the weekend, which might be a good thing we shall see. Will Williams even turn up with multiple chassis? We shall see or whether they're going to have to build something like this off if they want to get any points this weekend for Logan Sargent. Some teams, though, are probably not going to be massively happy in China. The McLaren hasn't got a good DRS efficiency and it isn't especially good on the straight lines and it doesn't really it's developed in the high speed corners but it hasn't really got the low speed performance that the Red Bull is able to generate right now and this is why you know some of these guys on a straight like this might not be so happy about it if you guys are unfamiliar with China as well just thought I'd talk through the track real quick because it's been five years since the last Grand Prix historically a very tough track on tires the way that these corner complexes are designed, you know, the really difficult traction zone of turn 13, this pretty crazy sector one where it just goes round and round to the right hand side and your front left is absolutely screaming. And then two mega straights towards the end of the lap. I think it's actually designed to look like um, a Chinese character or something like that anyway. But you've got a big sector three straight and then of course the run down into turn one. So an interesting track, not one of my favorites historically, but um, it is gonna be good for cars that have good all around performance and certainly straight line speeds will be relevant as usual but tire degradation is also rather key around here and the last time China was raced Verstappen had five wins now he has 57 so been quite the turnaround demo for the last few years but let's talk about the driver market because there are many names getting involved today Valtteri Bottas is one of them because last year and certainly the year before there were questions how well is Joe performing is Bottas really locked in you know is he the same level that he was when he was at Mercedes but recently he's been 12 in one against Joe in qualifying and the car isn't great the pit stops are great but he's generally I think doing a pretty good job Bottas right now and he's making a case that if stake as they're going to become Audi Audi Sauber are going to move on from some drivers Bottas is trying to make sure that's not him now the rumor has it they do want Hulkenberg but they're also prepared to part with both Bottas and Joe if a better opportunity presents itself and this is where the Red Bull question becomes very key because Checo Perez is performing right now at the level that Red Bull require of him he's got three second places in one two finishes of Red Bull over the first three races second in the championship. That's exactly what Red Bull require of Perez and that is what he is presently delivering. However, Sainz says that by mid-season, Ferrari are going to be there right where Red Bull are, opens the door to a potential real championship fight hopefully next season. Therefore, is Perez going to be able to maintain this level? Because last year he also started pretty well and then after Miami, it very quickly went rapidly downhill. I don't think Perez is going to fall off this year to that extent. But the question is, if an upgrade is available, do you go for it? Given the fact that Christian Horner seemingly now solidified in his power, probably doesn't care too much about what Max Verstappen and Verstappen's camp might think about it. If Horner feels like getting a theoretically superior driver in is best for the team, I think he's going to do that regardless of what Verstappen might think about it if he believes there is a serious championship challenge on the horizon. And there are big names on the market, right? This is also noted during the cool down room yesterday when Perez and Verstappen even were talking about how well Charles did, you know, being able to manage it to the one stop. And even <laughs> Perez says to Sainz, Charles was strong, eh? And I didn't really think much of this at the time, but having thought back on it, right, Sainz is arguably the key contender for Perez's spot next year at Red Bull, right? Because Ricardo, he ain't delivering on the level that they need him to. Sonoda is good, but I don't think Red Bull think that he's quite Red Bull caliber. So um, all of a sudden, maybe there's something to this whole Perez versus Sainz thing whenever they might come together on track. Fernando Alonso is available as well for next season. He made the comment about Mercedes and said that, well, Mercedes are behind us right now. Why would I want to go there? 
I guess there's a chance that Fernando retires, steps away. There is a feeling that Fernando, understandably, wants the Red Bull seat. But Christian Horner apparently wants him as well. Question is for Red Bull, does that make much sense? You bring in Alonso, even if you disregard the whole Verstappen camp not being happy with another very strong driver in the team as well, and what the repercussions of that might be. The way that Fernando operates, if he joins a team, he will try every trick in the book to try and find a way to win that world championship, right? That's what this guy does. So if you're Christian Horner and you're making this decision with the rest of the team, Alonso, I think, is more of a risk than Sainz is. But then again, he's only probably going to be around for another year or two, I imagine. I don't know how long Fernando's going to continue for. Still, of course, driving at a very good level right now, but he can't go forever. Like, even Fernando Alonso can't um, hold back time for eternity. And the general perception seems to be that Alonso's thinking, all right, either Red Bull or, you know, I'm not going anywhere else, right? which makes sense. Maybe he'll stay at Aston, maybe he won't, because there's some rumours lately that Aston might even have other ideas for what they want to do in that seat. Helmut Marko, though, says today the driver market has exploded in April, and normally nobody talks about it in April. So there's clearly a lot happening behind the scenes here. Toto Wolff even said the other day that as far as he knows, there is a big driver signing to a big team in the very near future. And we've talked about that that may well be Carlos Sainz somewhere. We don't exactly know where. It's ridiculous. We won't jump into this game ourselves. We will wait and see and then only make the best choice later on. So potentially willing to give Perez like a one year extension or something, but apparently they are going to take their time, which is interesting just because of the drivers in question, because Carlos Sainz, of course, is right up there in the conversation. This is how the article begins on Autosport. I'll leave a link down below. Sources have revealed that factions within Aston Martin want him, i.e. Sainz, to join the Silverstone outfit for 2025 alongside Stroll and lead it into the new rules rather than continue with Fernando Alonso. This is pretty crazy to me, right? That apparently people at Aston, at least some people at Aston, would prefer Sainz than Alonso, and of course Stroll ain't going anywhere. So maybe Alonso feels this or understands this in some way. That's why he's considering his options elsewhere and saying, you know, to Red Bull, hey, maybe get me in because Aston want to go a different way. And if Helmut Marko is telling the truth that Red Bull will bide their time, then maybe the rumours that Carlos Sainz is signing somewhere soon make more sense to Aston than elsewhere. So this is really the first we've heard that Sainz to Aston Martin could well be a thing, but the idea that Alonso would arguably be forced into like retirement if this was to occur, right? Because if they drop Alonso for Sainz and Red Bull don't get him, and Mercedes want to get Antonelli in the car, Where's Alonso going to go? Maybe he'd be forced out of the sport entirely, which would be a big shame, I think, given the way that he's performing. But clearly, very interesting things happening behind the scenes. Audi also would be a great option on paper for Sainz in the longer term, because Audi's record in motorsports they've competed in is very good. But it is nonetheless a long-term bet, and I'm sure that it's not top of the list right now for Carlos Sainz. But actually, Helmut Marko talks about Audi especially and says, I don't know what's going on. I have heard that Audi is making pressure, but it's a little bit strange for a new newcomer to make pressure on the driver market. He's feeling is that Audi are coming in, they're talking a big game, they're potentially going to try and pay some big money and lock down some of these guys. Sainz would be, I'm sure, their ideal candidate Audi, and Sainz should have multiple offers. So it's interesting because Red Bull might feel, and this is maybe what Helmut Marko is getting at, is that, well, Sainz is a very attractive prospect, and Aston are moving for Sainz. Audi are moving for Sainz. Arguably, Mercedes should be having a look at Sainz, and therefore Red Bull might think, well, maybe we need to swoop in now and get that deal done and replace Sergio Perez, or it might come back to bite us at some point. Now, Checo Perez did say that he expects a decision on his future within a month or so from now. I believe it's a matter of time. Obviously, the market is moving. The next few weeks are going to be a lot of movement for sure. So I expect within a month to really know what I am doing next year. So he is hopeful, I'm sure confident that he's going to get a Red Bull extension. But his feeling is this is going to be determined in the next few weeks. And Helmut Marko is saying that, well, given all the pressure in the market, Red Bull themselves might be moved to act or might be moved to act in the very near future as well. So yeah, what do you guys think about that? What do you think about this whole Sainz to Aston Martin kicking out Alonso thing? Because that would be rather fascinating if those sources are true and if those factions within Aston really have the power that we think they might have. And it would be a real shame, I've got to say, to Alonso, to see Alonso forced out of the sport with Lance Stroll still there. But very much intrigued to your thoughts on all this stuff in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care and I'll see you next time.